As World War II reaches to a close, the total annihilation of the Axis war machine is all but complete. The question remains what should be done with the leftover leaders and high-ranking officials of Nazi Germany. Multiple options were discussed, but in the end, it was decided that they would be put on trial. The proceedings would take place in Nuremberg. The city was chosen mostly because the Palace of Justice, where the trial would be held, was left largely intact by the Allied bombing, but also because of its symbolic value, as it was considered the birthplace of the Nazi party. But doubt quickly arose, especially on the German side, as to whether the trial would be conducted fairly and in accordance with the rule of law, or would it simply serve as an instrument of victor's justice? We will try to tackle this question with this video and hopefully discover the failings of the International Military Tribunal, but also its triumphs, and to determine to what degree did the individual actors of the trial remain objective and just when deciding the fates of men who were part of a regime that left an entire continent in ruins, sought to exterminate nations, and killed millions. Overall, there were actually 13 Nuremberg trials that were carried out between 1945 and 1949. The topic of this video will be the first and the most well-known one, frequently labelled as the greatest trial in history. It was the only trial of the 13 to be held before an international military tribunal. All the other trials were conducted before US military courts. The tribunal was given the task of trying 22 of the most important political and military leaders of Nazi Germany. After nine months, the verdicts in the major war criminals trial were read on October 1, 1946. Twelve defendants were sentenced to death, three to life imprisonment, and four to long prison terms, while three defendants were found not guilty. The legal basis for the trial was the London Charter of the International Military Tribunal issued on the 8th of August 1945. The Charter set down the laws and procedures by which the Nuremberg trials were to be conducted, and it also determined the crimes that the German defendants could be tried for. The Charter defined three main categories of crimes. Crimes against peace that concern with planning or waging aggressive war, war crimes that cover the inhumane treatment and murder of prisoners of war and civilians of an occupied nation, and crimes against humanity, such as the Holocaust. Although these legal terms seem well established and familiar to us today, at the time of the Nuremberg trials, most of these were considered revolutionary, but also to a degree controversial. By that time, war crimes were well established in customary international law and had been codified in written agreements. But it wasn't so clear cut when talking about crimes against peace and crimes against humanity. Up to that point, no individual statesman had ever been formally held accountable for launching a war, nor was there any agreement between the nations that explicitly forbade a government to kill its own citizens. The concept of war crimes was well developed through diplomacy before World War II in order to protect the population of one country from unlawful military action of another state, while crimes against humanity and crimes against peace weren't that well established before the Nuremberg trials. The lawyers of the defendants, in part, based their defense precisely on this fact. Namely, one of the main legal principles of any modern state is that one cannot be punished for doing something that is not prohibited by law. In essence, this means that retroactive application of criminal law is not allowed, which according to some is exactly what happened during the Nuremberg trials. The tribunal and the prosecution were all well aware of this problem before the trial even started and when reading the final verdict of the International Military Tribunal, one can immediately conclude that the judges took great effort to justify and legitimize the London Charter that established the possibility of individual culpability for crimes against peace and crimes against humanity. Part of the verdict reads as follows. The Charter is not an arbitrary exercise of power on the part of the victorious nations, but in the view of the Tribunal, as will be shown, it is the expression of international law existing at the time of its creation, and to that extent is itself a contribution to international law. 
The tribunal then continues to make the argument that although there is no treaty that explicitly establishes the possibility of individual culpability for said crimes, the already existing agreements represent adequate basis to conclude that individual responsibility for the crimes of one's country became a part of customary international law. In other words, it became general practice accepted as law by the international community, including Germany. Although the moral responsibility of the political and military leaders of Nazi Germany is unquestionable, the tribunal was criticized by some as victor's justice, given that the defendants were tried for crimes that did not formally exist when they were committed. But be that as it may, today the Nuremberg trials are considered a quantum leap forward when talking about the development of international criminal law, simply because of the fact that for the first time, an individual statesman couldn't hide behind state sovereignty in order to escape punishment. The tribunal consisted of American, Soviet, British and French judges. Critics, especially among the German populace, highlighted in particular the lack of impartiality among the selected members of the tribunal. Not a single judge from a neutral country had been called to join the judicial body nor were any German judges selected. According to many critics of the time, the tribunal had also violated the impartiality of the judiciary since both the prosecution and the judges came from the same four victorious nations and were therefore basically on the same side. The accusation of impartiality certainly wasn't lessened because of the fact that there was a substantial overlap between judge, prosecutor and lawmaker. Namely, the Soviet judge, Iona Nikichenko, French judge Robert Falco and the American chief prosecutor Robert Jackson were all involved in drafting the London Charter that served as the legal backbone of the trial. The defense of course took note of this fact and issued the following statement. The defense considered their duty to point out at this juncture another peculiarity of this trial which departs from the commonly recognized principles of modern jurisprudence. This one party to the proceedings is all in one creator of the statute of the tribunal and of the rules of law, prosecutor and judge. But all that said, it is important to note that multiple individuals took great effort on several occasions during the course of the trial to preserve the tribunal's impartiality. One of the more notable examples would probably be Lord Justice Geoffrey Lawrence, the British main judge of the tribunal. During Robert Jackson's cross-examination of Herman Goering, one of the most discussed moments of the trial, Jackson was starting to get noticeably irritated by Goering's lengthy responses and argued that he was unnecessarily prolonging the trial. Jackson requested that Goering be limited to yes and no answers, but Lord Justice Geoffrey Lawrence intervened on behalf of Goering, stating the following. Mr. Justice Jackson, the tribunal thinks the witness ought to be allowed to make what explanation he thinks right. After having given a direct answer to any question, he may make a short explanation and that he is not to be confined simply to making direct answers yes or no. Goering continued to speak, almost uninterrupted, for nine days. The legacy of the Nuremberg trials would also be tarnished in part because of the fact that it only applied to German offenders, even though the Allies on numerous occasions committed similar war crimes, albeit certainly not on the same scale as Germany. The British alternate judge of the tribunal, Sir Norman Burkett, while noting that the London Charter did not apply to the Soviet Union, the United States or Britain, declared, if it continues to apply only to the enemy, then I think the verdict of history may be against Nuremberg. Whether one agrees with Judge Burkett or not, the fact remains that the legitimacy of the Nuremberg trials was to a degree undermined because of its selective prosecution and it represents one of the main reasons why the trials are frequently labelled as victor's justice. The hypocrisy of the Allied nations is perhaps best exemplified by the secret protocols of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact from 1939. The agreement set up the carving up of Poland between Germany and the Soviet Union, a fact undoubtedly proven during the Nuremberg trial. According to the London Charter itself, this pact could very easily be labelled as crime against peace but the prosecution danced around the fact that the secret protocols even existed and the final verdict only briefly references the Molotov-Ribbentrop Act, even though Ribbentrop himself was one of the defendants. 
This was done simply because of the fact that if the prosecution incriminated Germany in this instance, the Soviet Union would automatically be incriminated as well, and this was simply out of the question. The role of the Soviet Union in regards to the trial is especially interesting because of the different approach the Soviet Union had compared to the other allies when talking about the way the trial should be conducted. During the entire course of the trial, a silent tug of war in this regard was constantly looming over the tribunal. Namely, for the Soviets, Nuremberg should have been nothing more than a show trial. For them, the guilt of the German offenders was already proven prior to the proceedings. All of the Allied nations recognized Nuremberg as a possible instrument of propaganda, but that was especially true for the Soviet Union. The Soviets wanted to use the trial not only to punish the defendants, but also to construct their own version of history. On one occasion, the Soviet prosecutor Rudenko even tried to blame one of the most infamous war crimes of the Soviet Union during the war, the Katyn Massacre, on the Germans. However, the other Allied prosecutors refused to support the accusation, and in the end, no one was charged or found guilty for the murder of over 20,000 Polish officers and civilians. The Soviet view of the Nuremberg trials is perhaps best exemplified by the final verdict itself. The only dissenting opinion in regards to the sentencing is offered by the Soviet judge, Iona Nikichenko. Nikichenko expressed disapproval to the acquittals of the three defendants, Schacht, Papen, and Fritsche, and the sentencing of the defendant Rudolf Hess to life imprisonment. For the Soviet Union, even the possibility of acquitting any of the defendants was almost abhorrent, and if it were up to Judge Nikichenko, all of them would have been found guilty. The failings of the Nuremberg trial certainly don't end here. The proceedings were rife with problems that would represent grounds for an appeal in any modern courtroom governed by rule of law. Other frequent criticisms of the trial include the lack of time granted to the defendants to prepare their defense, as well as the fact that the defendants were unable to appeal the final verdict to a higher appellate body. But all that said, it can be concluded that the Nuremberg trials were probably the best thing that could have happened to the Germans. They could just as easily have been simply shot, but the Allies decided to take the moral high ground, avoid Nazi martyrdom, and further legitimize the occupation of Germany to the German people. One can probably rightly label the Nuremberg trials as victor's justice, but to call it a show trial or a kangaroo court would be factually incorrect. The majority of historical and legal opinion is that given the circumstances and the political context of the time, the defendants were given a fair trial. The tribunal protected the defendants' right to be represented by counsel and the right to a public hearing. And in the end, what perhaps best exemplifies the fairness of the proceedings is the fact that not all of the German defendants were found guilty and blindly sent to the gallows, as many thought they would be.